Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out and pulling out extra chairs. Um, this is going to be an interesting topic for us to talk about here. It's not one that most people worry about most of the time, thinking about aliens. But there's a real possibility that we would, at some point in the near future, discover life beyond Earth. And we should be prepared to think about that as Christians. A lot of the new scientific discoveries and technologies that come along Christians have often been kind of playing catch up, trying to uh, get on board and understand what's happening. So this is a taste of what might be to come. But let's start first by looking back. 50 years ago last summer was the moon landing. This was a pretty exciting uh, 50th anniversary, especially for all of those who remembered it uh, the first time. Um, I do not, I was a tiny baby at the time, so now you know how old I am. So it was an incredible technical achievement. So engineer is hero, uh, as we saw in the movie Apollo 13, and incredibly brave explorers. Uh, we have here Buzz Aldrin on the left. No, uh, Neil Armstrong is on the left by the lander, and Buzz Aldrin is saluting the flag there. And now, I really couldn't ever be an astronaut. People have told me, oh, you're an astronomer. Do you want to be an astronaut? I'm like, I can't even do snorkeling. Like, I, I am just not very physically adept. I would, I would freak out. It would not be a good thing. But these folks are really uh, uh, courageous astronauts today, have to have an incredible uh, level of physical skill, um, mental knowledge, training, and stamina to do what they do. Now, uh, one of the images that the Apollo program sent back was this one, and it was particularly iconic and had a big impact for a lot of people. It is a photograph of the Earth from space. And we see a lot of photographs of Earth from space these days, but this was about the first one. We had, I think, maybe had some satellite images, but nothing from this far away. And in this, we got a whole new perspective on our planet. You can really see it as this oasis in the middle of the cold and dark of space. Here's our planet, and it has water and air and life. This is where you want to be. This is our home. Now, it also gave us a new perspective on ourselves. Like, all of humanity is on that little blue marble there, and there's a whole lot of space beyond Earth. And what, what does that mean for who we are? Some even thought it had uh, implications for how we thought about God. Oh, well, if God is just about stuff here on this you know, blue marble, how is God relevant to anything beyond this? Well, God is still present in space, and um, this was not reported much in the 50th anniversary, but before Buzz Aldrin left for the moon, his congregation gave him the uh, materials for communion, and he actually did communion in the lunar module. Um, it's, the, the quote is, he poured out a few drops of wine in the moon's low gravity, and the red liquid gracefully curled into the small silver chalice. He celebrated communion on the moon in recognition of God's sovereignty over us wherever we may be, on earth or beyond it. In Psalm 19, as we talked about on Monday, we read that the heavens declare the glory of God. It is God's world. And that the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The word of God, God's word. We have these two revelations from God in which he speaks to us, in which he reveals himself and reveals truths to us. In my own tradition, um, in the Reformed world, we talk about this in the Belgian Confession. Um, Article 2, the means by which we know God. We know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, since that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. And second, he makes himself known to us more openly in his holy and divine word. God reveals himself to us in both revelations. Um, my husband introduced me to this. He's like, I think you're going to like this. And I did, because not least because the universe part comes first. <laughs> I was like, yes. I was, I was studying astronomy in graduate school at the time. Now, we can think about these two revelations both as, well, there's a, a common metaphor of thinking of them as two books, um, the book of God's word and scripture, but also the book of God's revelation in nature. So picturing God as the author of both of these. And we believe that God speaks truly. He's uh, not attempting to deceive. And so there should be no conflict between these two revelations. 
And yet you run into all these tensions, all these pressure points. Um, so the conflict comes in in our human understanding. So science is our human interpretation of nature. A lot of times people think of science as just a body of knowledge, but for people who do science, we think of science kind of as a verb. This is an activity, this is a process by which we understand what's going on in the natural world, and we don't always get it right. We're constantly um, checking each other's work, modifying and improving. And so that means at any one point we might get something wrong in how we understand nature. But we're getting closer and closer to understanding what's really there. On the other side, for scripture, well, you know that Christians don't all agree on how to interpret scripture. We have had lots of debates over that. So there's also a human level of interpretation there, too, that can lead to us, not everybody's getting it right all the time. But we trust by the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we're getting at the essentials. So that means that there's going to be times when we seem to have conflicts um, between the two of these. And this, this diagram should give us a lot of hope, because when we are looking at this, we don't have to just give up and say, well, these things are in conflict, we're never going to figure it out. Well, no, they, they're both revelations from God. Ultimately, we will figure out the answer. And it also gives us a great basis for dialogue with each other, because almost all Christians can agree that something like this diagram is correct. Even if we are disagreeing about that human level of interpretation, we agree that, okay, they're, both of these revelations are important. We can't simply throw out a verse of scripture because it seems to conflict with science or ignore a piece of nature because it seems to conflict with biblical interpretation. We need to hang on to both. All right, so that's a general framework for thinking about a lot of issues where science and Bible intersect. Um, today, we're going to talk about aliens. So um, is there a possibility of life elsewhere, and what would that mean? So we'll start with the science side, and then we'll get to the theology side. So on the science side, the first question is, can we even see other planets? Can we see planets around other stars? So um, an analogy for that, so here's some lights. Picture yourself outdoors at a, a sports game um, a, a, in the dark, and these big floodlights are on, and you know how bright those are, and you, you kind of don't even want to look right at them. And now try to picture a little lightning bug, a little firefly right beside one of those. Are you going to be able to see that? Not really. This tiny little uh, firefly right next to those big floodlights? No, your eyes just get overwhelmed with how bright the floodlights are. That is what it is like looking for a planet around a star. The planet is incredibly bright, and the Sorry, the star is incredibly bright, but the planet is very hard to see. So, you know, there's the bright star like that. Now, we do have technology where we can block out just the star. It's very tricky to do. And you can then see planets going around the star. So here's a picture of one, 120 light years away. We have a, a system with three planets in orbit around that star. It turns out it's kind of inefficient to use that method uh, wholesale. There's other methods that are faster. And the... These methods have been ramping up in recent years. So this is a graph of um, years over, over time, over the history of this field from, where do we start here? From 1992 or so is the first planet discovered. And then here in 2014, 2016, we're getting thousands of planets being discovered. So it's been a, a, a booming business recently. The most efficient technique has turned out to be uh, one used by the Kepler spacecraft, and this is one which looks for planets to um, go right in front of their stars. So you can see in the diagram there, you've got the planets in orbit around the star, and when they come around, if you're looking at it at just the right angle, the planet is right in front of the star, blocking a little bit of the star's light. So if you're measuring the star's brightness very precisely, you can actually detect it gets slightly fainter when the planet is blocking a little bit of the light. This has turned out to be efficient, and we have now found, between this and other methods, over 4,000 planets around other stars. 4,000. That's an exciting number. Um, there's a Wikipedia page that updates this on a regular basis. I checked it this morning, and uh, 4,173 planets have been found around 3,096 stars, and more on the way. Let me just pause a moment to comment on the extravagance of our creator. 
So God could have made just our solar system and just a few planets, but he decided to make lots of planets. Uh, in biology, God also decided to make lots of different species. Um, there's this uh, um, the famous quote about beetles, because there are, I think, 400,000 species of beetles. Um, I am not personally fond of beetles. I would have been happy with maybe eight or 10 species of beetles. Do you think that'd be enough? Yeah, okay, 400,000. So our creator just creates in this abundant fashion, extravagantly, and what he pours out. Okay, back to the science. So um, this diagram is a little complicated, but it's has a lot of useful information, so I want to explain this one to you. The conclusion is that billions of stars are likely to have Earth-mass planets. So on the bottom axis there, we're talking about how far the planet is from their star. How long it takes to go around is related to that. So on the left, we have small orbits, planets that go um, are really close to their star. And on the right, we have large orbits, planets that are far away from their star. Then on the vertical axis, we have size of the planet. So little planets are at the bottom, big planets are at the top. Now, we can put our own planets on this graph. So there's a horizontal line there going, going toward a little dot for Earth. Um, you see the letter in the word rocky planets, the capital letter P? That's about where Earth would be. So uh, Earth is... All the planets above on this graph are larger than Earth. And you can see there Jupiter on the right, and the words hot Jupiters and cold gas giants. So those are large planets, and if they are close to their star, if they have a small orbit around it, then they heat up and they get hot. So we've been discovering all kinds of, lots of kinds of planets that we don't even find in our solar system, and just large numbers of them. And do you see how many dots there are in that yellow area for rocky planets? There are just lots of dots there. We're starting to really see a lot of planets that are comparable to our planet Earth. They're similar size, which means there's a similar um, level of gravity on the planet, and they're a similar distance from their star, which means that we're getting into the zone where um, uh, there could be liquid water on the surface of the planet. Okay. So not all of these planets are rocky planets, not all are suitable for life, but a decent number are. So in the end, what we find is about 40% uh, of all stars have a planet that could support life. Nobody knew what that number was before, but now we have enough here that we can figure out the statistics of that for the population as a whole. For the, so there's billions of stars in our galaxy, and we find that 40% of them, almost half, have a planet going around them that could support life. That's a lot of planets. That's billions of planets. Okay, so what does that mean for aliens? Does that mean that all those planets have life and have little green ET guys on them? Well, not really. So Francis Drake in the uh, middle of the last century, developed an equation to try to estimate how many alien civilizations there might be sending signals to Earth. How many should we expect? So he kind of runs these numbers together. Um, so first you have the number of stars in our galaxy. We know that one, about 200 billion. And then the fraction of those stars with planets that could support life, I just said that's 40%. And then you've, well, that's not enough. It, it could support life, but does life actually develop there? We don't know. And then if life develops, is that life intelligent? How often does that happen? We don't know that either. And of those who are sending, those where life is intelligent, how many of them are actually sending signals to us? We don't know that either. Maybe they're not interested in sending signals out into space. Maybe they just don't do that. So there's a, still a lot of uncertainty. Um, and I'll just give a caveat that um, I've modified Drake's original equation just slightly here, and there are a lot of other versions of this sort of equation. But it, it's a helpful sort of just kind of keep track of uh, how do we figure out how many aliens we should be expecting. So can we get any handle on these questions of whether life could actually get started, on how likely life is to get started? Well. 
All we've got is our own solar system, and we've got Earth. So just to give you a little context, on Earth, life did start pretty quickly. So this is a timeline. At the bottom is four and a half billion years ago when Earth formed. And, um, and if you're troubled by the billions of years there, I would be happy to talk with you about that afterwards. I addressed that some in my talk on Monday, and I'll address that again tonight. So four and a half billion years ago, Earth and the solar system form. And shortly after, Earth cools enough to have liquid water on the surface. And it's not too long after that in cosmic time scales that you have the first single-celled life. So it arose relatively quickly. But then it took another like two billion years to get multicellular life. So there were bacteria on our planet for a long, long, long time before we got anything that would look interesting, being multicelled. And then um, human intelligent life comes um, very late in this history. So if it's like that on other planets, well, that could mean these um, alien planets out there, maybe it's much more likely we will discover planets with bacteria on them than with intelligent life on them. We don't know. There are some telescopes being designed right now to look at the atmospheres of other planets to see if we can see signs of that bacteria life. All right, well, that's quite a bit of science. Um, hopefully the science-minded folks among you um, are tracking with that. Um, I have two more caveats to put in, and then we will get to the theology. So let's say we have all of this, that even that we've got an intelligent alien out there and he's transmitting, there's still two big hurdles to get past. One is that this would be a slow conversation at best. These planets are a long way away. So light takes time to travel. The nearest um, exoplanet that we know is 4.2 light years away. That's pretty nearby, but most of them are hundreds or thousands or um, much more light years away. So imagine them sending a signal to us, and then we figure out how to reply, and then we send something back, and it's years in between. So that's a challenge. And the other one is just translating. Like, what are they saying, and what does that mean? Uh, this was featured well in the movie Arrival. I thought that was a very intriguing movie in 2016, where their language turned out to be these circular things, and they had a different view of time entirely. And it just is to get us thinking about how challenging the translation aspect might be. OK. So now we're going to do the what if and figure out the theological implications. So what if we find a planet beyond Earth that not only has life, but has intelligent life, and we are successfully able to communicate with it about things so subtle as God and religion? Then what? <laughs> now, this is not a common topic in science fiction. So I love science fiction, the big blockbuster movies, some of the, the more um, literary books. I, I enjoy reading it. But it's very rare for it to engage religion in a substantive way. Um, a lot of times, religion will show up for in, in these things with uh, some primitive alien culture that's kind of mystical, and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. But the idea that the organized religions of Earth might have relevance to life on another planet is just hardly ever addressed. One neat exception is uh, a pair of novels by Mary Doria Russell, which talks about Jesuit priests be, uh, teaming up with some science types to head off to uh, meet some aliens. So that's a neat book to read about that. So what would this mean for Christian theology? Um, I'm going to consider five questions about that. And uh, I'm going to use the shorthand ETI for extraterrestrial intelligence. So question one. Would the discovery of ETI make the Bible irrelevant? Now, I've actually heard um, militant atheists make this claim. They're like, oh, the minute we get a, a signal from some alien intelligence, that's going to be the end of organized religion. <coughs> really? Um, and there, yeah, so... Sorry, the thing I was thinking of is um, there are surveys that have been done asking religious people, would the discovery of alien intelligence be a challenge for you? And most of them say no. No, I think we could accommodate that. Um, but a lot of people think that it's going to be a big challenge for somebody else's religion. <laughs> All right, well, I don't think it would be a challenge for Christianity. Part of what they're, um, what they're, they're thinking here is 
the, the Bible is only about Earth. The Bible is just very provincial, um, and it wouldn't have relevance beyond Earth. But actually, the Bible is aggressively provincial. It's not about the whole planet. It's not about all, um, all people in North America or South America. It's about one small geographic region and the descendants of one family. It's very focused in. And it's, so we're talking about the family of Abraham. And yet, it is also cosmic in scope. In Colossians, it says, for in Christ all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, and visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. It's like Paul is stumbling over himself trying to be as superlative and comprehensive as possible. He didn't think to say, and aliens on other planets, but I think that's in there somewhere, okay? So the claim of scripture is that God is the God of the entire cosmos and all life that might be found in it. So whether or not there are intelligent aliens, I believe the Bible's claims are cosmic in scope. If you want to read more about that, I recommend um, this recent anthology um, edited by Ted Peters called Astrotheology. And it has articles by many people exploring all these different theological implications. So there are a lot of theologians working on these questions. Okay, question two, how should we relate to extraterrestrial intelligence? I mean, what do we do about it? They might be friendly, or maybe they would be hostile, or maybe they'd be more powerful than us, or maybe they'd be more primitive than us, we just don't know. Um, Billy Graham said, I, I, I was a little surprised to read this, but he said, I believe there are intelligent beings, excuse me, like us far away in space who worship God. But, and we have nothing to fear from these creatures. They are God's creation. So I think, as with all of God's creatures, we should treat any life we find beyond Earth with respect and care. It might be friendly or dangerous, but we should treat it that way. OK, third question. Would the discovery of ETI reduce human significance? Now, some people are worried in this direction. And it's interesting, I hear worries in like opposite directions. Some say, oh no, if there's other life out there, then humanity would just be one of many kinds of life and we would be insignificant. And then I hear other people say, oh, but if we're alone, we'd be the only people in the whole universe and you know, we'd be so lonely and insignificant. Like, okay, <laughs> you can't have it both ways. Um, are we insignificant because there's many other species or because we're the only one? All right, we need a little bit more sophisticated way of encountering that. Here's a good quote from David Wilkinson in his recent book, also excellent. Um, While sharing much with other life forms, even perhaps intelligence and self-consciousness, human beings are, Im um, are embedded in the story of God's particular acts. This is not an appeal to human superiority. It is about a, an exceptional relationship, but not an exclusive relationship. Human beings can be special without denying God's love and concern for other intelligent beings. So he's arguing here that however we, God is relating to the other creatures, we know God is relating to us in special ways, in these particular acts, and that's what gives significance. And we know what those acts are. Christ becoming incarnate on our planet, and he was here, and Christ dying for our sins and Christ calling us to bear his image. All of these things are the basis for our human significance, even if God loves has other children as well. Okay, fourth question. Would ETI, uh, the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence, change our view of the incarnation? So this one is much debated, um, and even individual the um, scholars can have different points of view. So. Some people argue that if there are intelligent beings out there, that Christ would also become incarnate as one of them. And that sounds kind of freaky until you think of the Narnia stories. C.S. Lewis, in the Narnia stories, he has Aslan as the incarnate uh, creator and the same one as the children know on Earth. And it really has kind of this multi-planetary idea there. But then in another one of C.S. Lewis's books, is um, uh, his space trilogy, the story of Paralandra, he talks about um, the intelligent species there actually looking like humans because Christ had been incarnate as a human. And once that happened, that changed things forever. So 
is it that there's just the, that Christ is incarnate many places, or that in just one place? Well, there are so those are multiple options. Um, I don't think it's a showstopper, but there are serious theological implications of both of those. So Christians have multiple views of what God is doing with the aliens, but we do know that Christ took on human form. So I'll play out a few of these implications here in this final question. Um, what would this mean for our view of the cross and redemption? And, um, and here's yet another recent book, if you'd like to dig into it, by um, Van Vanio. And he lays out four options, and these kind of cover both the incarnation and the cross. So first option. Maybe the aliens are not fallen, and they have no need for redemption. You have to keep this in mind. They might be intelligent, but maybe they chose differently than our parents, our, than Adam and Eve in their choice. So maybe they don't need redemption, and we don't need to think about the incarnation and redemption in the terms in which God has done it here. Or, second option, maybe the aliens are fallen, but maybe God has a different plan for them of how they could be redeemed, how they could come back to God. We have a hint of that in how God relates to angels. So we know that some of the angels rebelled against God and fell, the, the devil and others, but we don't know much else. It doesn't sound like there's a plan for redemption for them. So there, um, maybe for some species on another planet, it might be similar to the angels. A third option, maybe the aliens are fallen, and they're included in Christ's redemptive work on Earth. Now, this is a common, uh, well, I, I've heard this view from Lutherans who have a very high view of Christology, the supremacy of Christ, and saying that Christ's work was so cosmic that it would cover the redemption of any creature um, in the universe, not just on Earth. So does that mean we need to go and bring the gospel then and be missionaries to the aliens? I don't know. Fourth option, the aliens are fallen, but um, and their, their nature is assumed by God in an act of incarnation and redemption on their own world. So Christ goes and visits them on their world, and they have a similar path to God as we do. I, from what we know of God's character, I'm sure God loves all creatures, and maybe he would desire to do a similar sacrifice for them that he did for us. But then we also know that the second member of the Trinity had a bodily resurrection, and that in heaven he still has a human form. So then does he also have an alien form? Like, how does that work? So there are some challenging questions there. You're probably not going to fall asleep tonight. You're going to be like, boy, what about that? What about that? So lots of, of crazy ideas here. But while there are multiple views on this, we do know that Christ died to redeem human sin. Nothing will change that. All right, I've thrown a lot at you. If you want to read more, uh, we have more on this at BioLogos. Um, as Rachel introduced, we are about this intersection between modern science and biblical faith and how these can work together in harmony. You can read more on this topic and many others. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're very active there. Um, you can subscribe to our podcast, Language of God, and that's, uh, if you like podcasts, this is a great way to um, hear from some of our best speakers, hear from a lot of scientists and uh, leading theologians about these topics. We also have a discussion forum on our website, and uh, you can subscribe to our email news newsletter, so there's lots of ways to get involved. We also have a table out there in the back where you can uh, get a sampling of some of our articles and learn more. I hope you check it out. <coughs> So just to close, uh, I wanted to give a final thought. Um, 50 years ago, humans stepped foot on the moon. But about 2,000 years ago, the God of the universe stepped foot on Earth. Christ became incarnate, incarnate. He was the creator through whom all things were made. But he chose to become flesh and made his dwelling among us. He moved into the neighborhood, and he got his feet muddy in the Jordan River and became one of us. We have seen his glory. And my prayer is that all people on earth and beyond will come to know this creator of the universe and his incredible love and self-giving love for us. Thank you.
you so much, Deb. You've given us a lot to think about. We do have some time. If you have questions, I would just ask that you would keep them um, brief and you would make them questions uh, rather than statements. And we have a couple of microphones, so I'll put this one on the stand. Yeah. Questions? Ah, here's some. Yes. Step right up. I love questions. Yes. Is this too, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the one of the big acts that acts that Jesus took um, on Earth would be that of um, reinterpretation, like taking the taking the existing theology and um, like. Re reframing it, bringing it into new, so I, um, you have heard it said, but I say to you, that yeah. sort of reframing. Mm -hmm. um, and so wouldn't it make sense with the de discovery of extraterrestrial life, not necessarily to try and like force our existing theology to match with this reality, but to take a new interpretation, like take a new uh, view of like that marriage between scripture and nature? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that is kind of the work that God has called the church to do, not to throw out the old, but not to let it just sit there either and sort of fossilize. Um, N.T. Wright is a, a renowned New Testament scholar, and he describes the work of the church in every generation is to rearticulate what the gospel is really saying for the, the, the times that we live in. And the discovery of life elsewhere would certainly impact that, and we would be finding ways to articulate what this all means. Um, how, how far that extends beyond what we know already is hard to say. It all depends somewhat on what we find. But yeah, I think it, in, in my tradition, we call that always reforming. So we're always uh, developing. We're keeping hold of the anchor of the core truths, but continuing to develop. Other questions? Yeah. With alien life, we're always thinking about how, you're, we're also thinking about how did these people become what we might call alive? You know, we don't know. They may not even move, right? We, <laughs> we have no clue. Uh, so we then reflect, as you did toward the end here, about how life in, started for us. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued, and you may cover this tonight, so you can just say that and then... Uh, how did we, uh, the way I understand it, the first thing that happened after the Big Bang, most people, the Big Bang is now like evolution, right? Most scientists accept that to be the truth. Mm -hmm. The first thing was hydrogen, right? Element. Yep. And then quite a while later came helium. Now, what, what was the sequence, or how, what, how did organic life begin starting with hydrogen? Oh. You should have been in Rachel's you, class you got, yesterday. I talked three, about it. Uh, you got three minutes. Three, oh, three minutes, yeah, for the whole history of how life got started. Okay, I'll give you just a sketch. So the universe, um, our measurements now show it started 13.8 billion years ago. And yes, in that initial explosion, we had a lot of elementary particles that, by, that quickly formed into most hydrogen and some helium. And then it took another, oh, a few million years to get the first generation of stars. And then those stars you know, are forming in star clusters. Those clusters are coming together and making galaxies. And you need a few generations of stars to get um, the heavier elements because it's in the cores of stars that you get things like oxygen and nitrogen and carbon, which are the best ones for making molecule, molecules relevant for life. So those are made in the cores of stars, and then those stars die, and those elements get spread out and incorporated into the next generation, and so on. And then around these stars are planets that are forming as we get more of these uh, heavier elements. And so the, the oxygen and other elements that we have here on Earth relevant for life initially formed in a, some distant star, in the core of that star, and then got incorporated into our planet um, as the planet was forming around our star. So I can tell you how the, all the elements got there. And then once the goo or whatever turned into the first cell, I can tell you how things evolved since then. But in between there is a big question mark, a 
big area of active research of how you get that first life, how you get those chemicals come together and actually make something that is reproducing and, and sustaining. So that's the cool question these days. Uh, can you help me out on that yeah. one? Uh, yeah, with bacteria. Yes. With bacteria. With bacteria. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. 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 Photosynthesis there with single cell organisms. Other questions? I think you're the first one. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I've been reading a bit about the, uh, the great filter as an idea to explain like the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation, the idea that there's like a series of catastrophes that prevents interstellar civilizations from reaching a point where they could contact us. Uh -huh. And it seems to me that there's kind of a parallel between that and the biblical flood, which God has sort of promised not to do again, never to like wipe out an entire, mm -hmm. like, you know, all life. So I'm wondering, does that, uh, like what are your thoughts on that idea and does that have any theological implications for you? Oh, what an interesting parallel. Uh, so this, the, this filter idea, okay. The, how likely is it that there's a life out there? I said it's a big question mark. Some people think that it's very unlikely. There's some Christians who argue, oh, life could only happen once. We are so unique. It couldn't have happened anywhere else at all, even though there's billions of planets out there. And there's other Christians who think, Oh, God set it up so that life would develop everywhere, lots of abundant life, and we could expect to find lots of life everywhere. Um, scientifically, there, people also have that full range, but a lot of people are sort of thinking, well, it seems like there ought to be more life, and yet we're not seeing it. We're not seeing any signals from aliens. We're not seeing any other evidence for it yet. No one's visited. Yes, no one has visited Earth. Okay, not happened. Uh, so. So then the question becomes is where is everybody? What happened? And so there's a lot of science fiction and more serious speculation as to what might have caused other species. Maybe, maybe they um, end up dying off. You know, we almost killed ourselves off with the, um, the nuclear tensions between the US and Russia and we somehow survived that. But you could imagine a civilization that kills itself off. Or maybe they go into some weird kind of hibernation and just lose interest in the outside universe. All sorts of speculation about what that might be. And then you make an interesting parallel. Could it be parallel to the flood? The flood is God's judgment on a sinful people, and he promised not to do it again. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. There could be some fruitful speculation there, but I haven't thought much about that particular one. Yeah, Naomi. Where, where was she? Oh, okay. Hi, I was just uh, going to ask you, do you believe the laws of physics change with greater knowledge in the universe? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, do the laws of physics change with greater knowledge? If I unpack that a little bit, does our understanding of the natural world change over time? Definitely. So in Newton's era, we got Newton's law of gravity and the laws of motion. And that still describes just about everything in everyday life and everything in the universe. But there, with Einstein, we found actually we need something else to understand very intense gravity. We need the curvature of space and general relativity. The thing is, Einstein's model also explained everything that Newton explains, just with more messy math, but it explains all of that. Plus, it explains things like black holes. So we still teach Newton to all of the students because it's really much easier to use. So will there be something beyond Einstein's general relativity? Could be, probably, uh, but whatever it is, we'll still have to explain all of the everyday stuff and the black holes and everything that we already currently understand. So um, it's not that it's going to upend our current understanding so much as add to it and ex uh, help us explain new things out there. Hi, right, so we've seen in human history that any time a religious group meets another religious group, there tends to be a lot of conflict, and we can see this happening again and again throughout history, and even in uh, biblical scripture as well. Do you think, with the discovery of ETI, do you think humanity would have the wisdom to not repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Your question makes a very good point. It, it is, it, human nature is interesting, isn't it? Because there's a lot of us who enjoy discovering what's different and discovering the other, 
but we also have this really strong human tendency to reject the other and just circle the wagons to like, okay, here's my people, I understand my people, and their other. And so I'm sure that'll come into play with intelligent aliens, and all the worse because they, it's not human form, probably their physical form will not look attractive to us, that's highly likely, and so then you have this visceral negative reaction that way. So maybe it's all the more important for Christians to be active in this area and be laying sort of a groundwork and an expectation that discovering life elsewhere will be a reason to praise God that he created more things. And these creatures would be creatures that we should respect and care for and even love, not ones to, be, to exert violence on or to be in immediate conflict with. Now, Maybe it'll turn out that they're predatory or they're in conflict with us, and so you can't just you know, have a really easy uh, reconciliation or something, but at least we shouldn't be the ones to start the hostilities, and yet I fear in human nature we would go that direction. So uh, I hope the Christian church can lead the way in good thinking about the potential of life elsewhere. So thank you again so much for this thought-provoking uh, talk. Thank you all for being here with us today and the questions that uh, have come up. And I invite you again to join us tonight at 7 o'clock in Marpec to hear more from Dr. Harzma. I think we have a longer, uh, a longer session then. Uh, for faculty who want to join us for lunch today, we're in D33. We're not in the conference room. Um, yeah, thank you again. Okay, thank you all.